Good morning. And welcome to another gathering of the remnant. To our virtual family, as well as our face-to-face -face worshipers here this morning, I bid you now to come, gather with the remnant. Let us engage our God, nourish our people, restore our faith, and equip ourselves in the work, the will, and the ways of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Amen? Come go with me to the ninth chapter of Acts. We're going to start at the 17th verse of the ninth chapter of Acts, starting at the 17th verse. Now I'll be reading from the New International Version, the word. When Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. So ends the reading of God's word, but never the power contained therein. I would like to focus our attention this morning on the 18th verse. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. From the words we've just read, I offer you a message entitled, Restoration. Restoration. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, help us. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. There are times as a preacher or speaker that you, you miss and you disconnect with your audience or your congregation or your parishioners. There is like something between the two of you and you can't quite seem to connect. It's one of those things that happens even with coaches and players. Uh, they're not performing as you think they should and you try to break through that in order to get them to understand it. So sometimes there's yelling and screaming and then sometimes it's a quiet talk. You pull them to the side. So before I begin this message this morning, there is something the Holy Spirit told me to tell you so that you will get this message in its entirety and you don't leave not quite sure what the message is about. You see, in the book of Psalms, David wrote that when God created us, he made our ins and out everything about us and he made us wonderfully and fearfully made. And I need for us to understand this because somehow or another we begin to listen to the world and the world expresses that we may not be this, we may not be that, or we're not what they want us to be. But God says that he has made us perfect in his will. God knew exactly what he was doing and made us precisely the way he wanted us to be. All the way from every cell in our body, even the DNA in our eyelashes, 
are made by God. They're not made. Your parents is a part of the process. But your parents didn't make you. God did. I need us to get that. God made you special, and he has a special plan for you. Even David knew, or Jeremiah knew, even before I was formed in my mother's womb, God knew me. Even before you came in the twinkle of your father's eye or in the smile of your mother's lip, God was already planning for you before you even got here. In other words, God has made us perfect. Now, I want you to think about this. Even before you were born, God knew everything about you. Check that again. Now, I, I, I need you to grasp this concept. Even before you were born, God knew everything about you. And he made you the way he made you because he has a plan for you. Now, now, if you understand what I just said, say amen. Now, see, not everybody not saying amen. So I don't know, maybe you think I'm just asking you politely, but I'm trying to get, I'm, I, I need to understand, I'm not asking you to say amen for you. I'm asking you to say it for me so that I know that you understand what I'm saying. You are wonderfully and perfectly made by God. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Okay, because I need you to understand that because as I transverse this text, I need you to hold on to that thought. Hold on to it. Don't let it go. Keep it in the forefront of your mind because as I start talking, you'll start to drift off and start thinking about other things or wonder why I said that. And then before you know it, you'll be way over there in left field and we're down the middle. So if you understand that you are wonderfully made by God, say amen. amen. All right. This text in Acts is written by Saul, whose name now is Paul. We know him as Paul. But Saul was born Saul of Tarsus. In those days, they didn't use last names. We all got last names. And sometimes we argue over the last name that we got. But in this case, they named themselves after the city or the village, or the countryside that they were a part of. So it was Saul of Tarsus, Jesus of Nazareth. These are names that were given so people would understand who you are. And that's why there's so many Johns, even in the Bible. It's like, which one? Where there's John the Elder, there's John the Apostle, there's John the Disciple. And so when we start reading the text, sometimes we get confused about, well, which John is this? Or which Saul is this? Or why is Saul now Paul? You see, like most of us, Paul didn't choose his parents. I mean, raise your hand if you chose your parents. I don't think so. So even before, <laughs> even before you were born, God had already decided what your life was going to be about and who you were going to be with and what your plan was he had for you in life. Saul didn't choose his parents. He didn't choose where he grew up. There were circumstances that he came into. Because some of us could have been born in India. Some of us could have been born in Africa. Some of us could have been born in China. So God knew this ahead of time. So now Saul of Tarsus grew into a community that was very specific. They were called Pharisees. Pharisees are religious people that stuck to the Torah. The Torah are the first five books of the Bible of the Old Testament. Now you got to remember now Saul right now of Tarsus didn't have a Bible. He didn't have what you have. 
He had scrolls that were written for the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And they expressed how you were supposed to live, what you were supposed to do, where you were supposed to go, what you wasn't supposed to do, and who you wasn't supposed to be involved with. It was a very strict kind of law. And they didn't play around. You did not play around if you were a Pharisee. You were a teacher and learner and giver of God's word. Sometimes we got God's word, but we don't really give it the way we hear it. Because we have to soften it for some others. And then there's others that we have to hit them straight between the eyes with it. Saul's upbringing was that you went by the word of God, period. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. His belief was in absolution of the law. The first ten commandments that was given to Moses wound up, wind up into 365 new laws and messages, and you had to know all 365 of them, and you need to make sure that they were all done, because if you wasn't, if you didn't, then you were not a good person. And you would have to have some type of behavioral correction. So as we're toiling down here now, we sometimes lose our luster. We sometimes lose our shine, our, our glory that God has given us because the world seems it just keeps rubbing us the wrong way or taking from us or beating on us. And the exact same thing happened to Saul. And this uprising happened. And all of a sudden they started talking about this guy named Jesus. There wasn't no Jesus in Saul's writings. And there were people that was calling this guy Jesus God, the son of the true and living God, that he was the savior of the world. Now just imagine that for a moment when Saul is being told, oh, there's only one true God. Yahweh is his name. And if you put any other God before him, death would ensue. So I need you to understand what Paul was thinking as he was growing up. It's not like we're thinking now, but check it. Even now, if we have or hear someone down talk or downplay our Jesus, do we not get upset? So the same thing is happening here with Saul. Based on Saul's upbringing, he was right to stamp down any ideal of Christianity. He was Jewish. That's it. It's Jews and infidels. And now you're calling this infidel Jesus the son of the true and living God? I don't think so. Not from Saul's perspective. So stop pretending you are absolutely sure that what you've grown up believing is the absolute will of God. Because that's what Saul did. He believed that what he was being told and what was written in that word was the absolute word of God. And anything outside of that, he had to destroy. Go to the text. Meanwhile, Saul is a Pharisee's Pharisees. He is the top level echelon person that understands the rule and the laws of God. And anybody that violates them, he would have to punish because he's like a high priest. So he decided that he was going to go out and stamp down this ideal of Christianity. And he did so by murdering Christians. They walk to you and ask you, are you a Christian? Okay, you're going to jail. You're a Christian? Okay, we're going to take you and hang you. You're a Christian? We're going to take and kill you. You're a Christian? And some of that, we now live today free to be able to say, I love Jesus. But back in this day, you can't say that right now, not to Saul. Saul is not going to have it. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So for what we're reading now, 
is now an indication that Saul has been putting in work to stamp out Christianity. He was going from place to place, finding people who said that they were Christians. There was a Columbine story where the individuals who came into Columbine went around the schools and shooting individuals. And they got to this one girl, as the story goes, and he pointed the AR-15 at her face and said to her, do you believe in Jesus? If you do, I'll send you to him right now. And she said, yes, and he pulled the trigger. I want you to think about that commitment that she had that she would be willing to die for. Same thing is happening now in this text. Saul, though, was not satisfied with the job he was doing in terms of taking people and imprisoning them who were Christians. So he went to another high priest and he said, you know what? Give me a letter of permission so I can leave this area and go find them out there. Because I need to get rid of these Christians. He gets the letter. He gets his crew together. And off they go looking to try to find anybody else that's a Christian. And they would take them, imprison them, or kill them. Saul didn't care if they were male or female, bond or free. If you were a Christian, he was crushing you. Because that's what he believed. Saul was serious about his faith. He was enthusiastic about his call. And so committed to his God that Saul was willing to travel near and far to distant lands to find any infidels who would dare call themselves Christians. To Saul, God was not a plaything. He didn't go to the synagogues just to sit up and listen to the speaker of the hour or go to find out who's there or went to find out what they were dressed like or went to find out how much money they was putting in. Saul was a, not a plaything. God was not a plaything to him. So Saul and his crew was traveling looking for men, women, boys, and girls that claimed the name of Christ. And as he was going along, riding his horse, a lightning strike hit. Boom! And it caused him to be knocked off his horse, he lands on the ground. And he hears these words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Just imagine that Saul is knocked off his horse, he hits the ground, and he hears these words. How many of us have heard the word of God? Raise your hand if you've ever heard the word of God. So you know what I'm talking about. So the first thing that Saul does is he says, Who are you, Lord? Now see, now this is the thing about the text now. This is where you come in. You have to figure out, how did Saul say it? Did he say, Who are you? This voice that he hears. Who are you? Are you the Lord? Or did he say, who are you, Lord? But then he would know who he is if he said, Lord. But then he says, he says, who are you, Lord? Now, how would you have said it? This happened to you. I want you to think about it. How would you have said it? God slaps you around, knocks you down. And then you hear him tell you something. Well, you say, you, you know it's him, but you're going to ask who it is? 
So this is where you have to enter the text. This is where you have to get into the text and try to figure it out. You see, here is where you find yourself in the text. So the light replied, I'm Jesus, the one whom you are persecuting. Boom. Saul? Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. And you're persecuting me and my people. Why? Because you are one of my people. And we talk about black on black crime, but we're not going to go there. Why are you persecuting my people? But never mind, Saul. This is what I want you to do. I want you to get up and go to this city. And they will tell you what to do. Hmm? Wait a minute. I'm a murderous, imprisoning person that cannot see now. And you're telling me to go to a city and go to this man called Anaya. What's going on? What's happening in the text that's kind of disheveling to you? It is to me. This is the stuff I get stuck on. I get stuck. I, I, I'm reading it and I, I don't get it. I'm like, come on now. What, what are you trying to say to me here? Well, the text tells us that the, the men that was traveling with Saul, they saw the light, they heard the sound, and they heard the conversation. So it wasn't just Saul's imagination. They heard the exact same conversation. Now, Saul cannot lead them anymore because he's blind. So the men, they get on their horse and they drag his horse behind them and they move on into the street called Straight, which is a very interesting situation. They get to the street called Straight. They go in and they see this man called Ananias. And by the time he gets there, God has already met with Ananias and told Ananias, hey, there is a guy coming here by the name of Saul of Tarsus, and I want you to touch him and bless him and uncover his eyes. And Ananias is going, well, wait a minute. Ain't that Saul the one who's been murdering our people? And you're bringing them to me? Now, something fit in the text now. God is telling you to do something good for someone bad. God is telling you to do something for a murderer. God is telling you, you are the one that must do this for him. And then he says this to Ananias, because he is my chosen one. The man who has killed hundreds of Christians, imprisoned hundreds of Christians is now standing at your doorstep and you are supposed to go out there and give him back his sight. In the 11th verse of the, of the same chapter, the Lord said to him, go to the house of Judah on the street called Straight and ask for a man and he'll be praying for you. And Ananias said, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord says to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles their kings, and the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So often, we only see people for who they are and who they are right now. Well, God sees us from when we will be. Now and will be, there is a timeline. 
And just because a person is this way now doesn't mean that they're going to be that way always. And this is the part of why forgiveness is so important to the Christian. Because the person acted or performed something that is so heinous and wrong to the law does not mean that they don't have the opportunity of a second chance with our God. We might be done. To the left, we're out. But to God, he sees not only the beginning of your life, but the end of your life and has made a plan for your life. The text tells us that when he gets there, Ananias covers his eyes, prays on to God, and immediately, It was like scales fell from his eyes and he could see again. Paul's sight was restored. Now we're thinking sight in terms of it being a physical sight. Put yourself in the text. Saul was seeing physically. But now when he is restored back to the beginning, which I asked you to remember that God has made us wonderfully and perfectly made with a plan for us. That's what Paul can now see. He's been restored back to when he was before in his mother's womb. When he was to be an instrument of God. So no matter what you go through and no matter what happens to you and no matter what people do to you, God still has you in mind. And his plan will not and cannot fail. All you have to do is do what God has called you to do. The text tells us when his sight was restored, he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And his name was changed. His name was changed from Saul to Paul because he had restored his call that God had given him. Remember Jacob, for some of us who are uh, 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 good from a theological standpoint, Jacob, his name got changed to what? Israel which became the nation of Israel, and the name had to change. You you, you remember Simon? Simon, once he understood what God's call was for his life, he went from Simon to Peter upon the rock. Upon the rock, this church shall be founded, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. There was a name change. And Saul went from murderer to savior. Now, some of us wouldn't trust Paul right now, as far as you can see. And that's because we only see people for where they are right now. Just imagine the power and the beauty if you were able to see people, not where they are now, but where they will be later on in life. In other words... Paul was restored to his original calling of God. Remember, you said you would remember that God formed us perfectly. Didn't you say amen? Was he perfect when he was killing folk? Was he perfect when he was imprisoning folk? But you got to remember, he was perfectly and wonderfully made. Each of us are godly, unique, and are able to have a plan made by God for us. And God has decided how everything is going to work out. Our difficulty sometimes is just trusting that God still has us. That's the difficult part. It's just trusting because the world around us gives us so much other stuff that we see with our physical eye, but we don't see with our spiritual eye. Being allowed to be born again, reborn anew, 
restored to our original creative design. Now that's resurrection. That's resurrection. That's resurrection and restoration. When you are restored back to your original design. Having all of your guilty stains washed away as white as snow. That's restoration. When you're given a second chance to live life the way life is meant to be lived, that's restoration. When that which was lost is refound, rebuilt, reformed, regiven, reblessed, that's restoration. The ideal of being one thing today, giving your life to Christ. And being reborn into a restorative body of people. Because we've all sinned and have fell short of the glory of God. But restoration takes us back to our original call. And we are now restored to do God's work. Restored to do God's will. Restore to do God's way. Restoration is such an important thing for us to understand. But we can't understand it if we don't remember that God has blessed us. That God has made your life perfect just for you. But then sometimes it's the afflictions of this world that challenge our very essence and now we're not quite sure we're doing it right people doing us wrong so we don't forgive and we don't give because that's what we see we only see the right now but we need the scales to fall from our eyes so that we can see what God sees 